coming up. What do Queens, We Will Rock You, uh, The Beatles Come Together, Aerosmith's Walk This Way, and uh, ACDC's Back in Black all have in common? Well, today's featured song for one. Uh, each played a role in the creation of this 11th hour hybrid track. Actually, the songwriter didn't think it was even worth recording. Just wanted to save it for the next album. I mean, this band had been in the studio for years and they were ready to be done with this thing. But when their producer heard him playing this song, he said they had to do it. They had to. It was the best hook he'd heard in five years. And it was the right call. It became the most important track on the record because it actually saved the album from being a failure. It turned it into a blockbuster we all hear today. It single-handedly turned everything around. So step inside, join us for Professor of Rock next. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time, especially today. You know, if you remember uh, putting Elmer's glue on your hand and letting it dry so you could peel it off, making it look like you're ripping off your skin, kind of like that TV show V back in the 80s. You're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. <laughs> Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the red button and the notification bell so you always know what's coming. Also check us out on Patreon. We have additional uh, catalog there that you can check out. That helps us to keep it a daily channel. We are a self-funded channel. So that memory, um, hopefully I wasn't the only person that did it. I know my friends did it too. <laughs> That's kind of pulling one out. So it's time for another edition of our show number one in our hearts. This is the show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, no question. But for whatever reason, the song came up short. I always love doing this segment. It's kind of an uh, homage to Casey Kasem, one of my heroes. Just like many of you, I listen to his show, The American Top 40, every single week. You know, rooting for my favorite songs to top the charts. You know, sometimes we cover a song that made it into the top five, but... Had it been released a month earlier or even later, it would have hit the top spot. Today, definitely one of those tracks. This one should have been number one. Finished at number two. Many are going to be shocked to find out that it missed number one uh, because of Richard Marks, actually. Talking about Def Leppard's hit, Pour Some Sugar On Me, from their 1987 blockbuster, Hysteria. You know, Def Leppard pretty much marched through hell to create their long-awaited follow-up to 1983's Pyromania. It would be a long four years between the two albums. We've talked about it many times. You know, during that time, drummer Rick Allen, the Thunder God, he was in a horrific car accident, and although he survived, he lost an arm. Absolutely devastating to the band, especially for the drummer. But uh, his bandmates, they stuck by him all the way. And amazingly, Rick learned to play with one arm. There are other obstacles as well, uh, from a rotating cast of producers to endless hours of recording and re-recording in the studio. Uh, just making a stereo, it was an arduous three-year task. It also turned out to be one of the most expensive albums ever produced. Reportedly, it needed to sell 5 million copies just to break even. Again, many of these things we covered, so we won't repeat it here. Uh, as many of you know, though, ultimately, famed producer Mutt Lang, he took charge. And with his help, the boys of Def Leppard turned this struggling project into a definitive 80s album. They envisioned it as the hard rock answer to Michael Jackson's Thriller, you know, which had been a hit-making machine, had seven top 10 singles. Only one of three albums to ever do that. Incidentally, after its release, Hysteria kicked out uh, seven of its own hit singles. Animal, Women, Hysteria, Love Bites, Armageddon, it, Rocket, and today's featured song, Pour Some Sugar On Me. I don't think anyone can argue it isn't one of the most iconic tracks of the 80s, overplayed or not. But the crazy thing is, is that Sugar 
almost didn't make it on the Hysteria. It was an 11th hour edition, as many know. What many don't know is uh, it's the last track they recorded for the album, and they actually, Joe Elliott wanted to save it for the next album. I actually just talked about this. It happens a lot. The last song recorded for the album becomes the big hit. Happened with Everybody Wants to Rule the World. But frontman Joe Elliott, he said that Def Leppard was finishing up six months of recording in Holland when the song came together. It was the weekend, and I guess the rest of the band was gone on break from there. It was just him and Mutt Lang in the studio. They're putting the finishing touches on the vocals for Armageddon It. They were way past the time for this album to come out. Now, at one point, Mutt stepped out of the studio for a coffee break. While he was gone, Joe Elliott started playing this song he'd been working on. Said Joe about it. I just picked up this acoustic guitar in the corner of the control room and I started playing these three chords around in a circle and seeing this uh, hook over the top of it. Now, when Mutt Lang came back into the room, he was completely blown away by what he was hearing. He said, Joe, what is this? Now, it's just an idea I've been working on. That's what Joe said. But he was quick to add that it didn't really matter. They already had 11 songs for the album and years invested into it, I might add. Last thing they needed was another song to record. He just put it on the next album. It could wait. That's what he said. He was going to put it on the next album. That's something that just came out lately. So that was that. But Mutt Lang, he would not let it go. When Joe said, hey, it can wait for the next album, Mutt replied, oh, no, it can't. That's the best hook I've heard in five years. Play it again. Now, when Mutt Lang says it's the best hook he's heard in five years, especially back in the 80s, that means something. So Joe was like, all right, started into it. So at this point, Mutt asked him, you know, what's this thing called? And Joe hadn't given it a name yet. But the chorus had the words, pour some sugar on me. So they just went with it. Incidentally, Joe would say that the lyric was inspired by a number one bubblegum hit, Sugar Sugar by the Archies. I think we've mentioned that way in the past. But there were fond memories from his childhood, maybe one of the first records he had. Sugar, sugar. So just then, Mutt takes out the Armageddon it tape and he replaces it with a blank one. And then Lang programmed the percussion to a we will rock you kind of rhythm just to give Joe something to play along with. This is where it gets really fun. Buddy, you're a boy, make a big noise playing in the street. So there was the we will rock you drums. And then next he plugged in an electric guitar and they started banging out some chords. He said, any ideas for the rest of the lyrics? And uh, Joe said, no, I hadn't got that far. Well, what about melodies? Well, Joe said he'd been seeing it to the meter of the Beatles come together. together right now. Here, Mutt, he decided to get creative. He had him split up into different corners of the control room, cassette recorders in hand, and each just started scatting their own lyrics to the song. You know, Cab Calloway style, if you will. It was an exercise in improvisation. When they were done, Joe listened to Mutt's tape and he swore he heard him singing Love is Like a Bomb. Mutt said he wasn't, but he thought it was pretty brilliant, so they just used it. It's just so cool how these things came out of nowhere. Also out of this songwriting clinic, uh, they came up with phrases like, come and get it on, living like a lover with a radar phone, and looking like a tramp like a video vamp. Joe also uh, took some inspiration from the police's demolition man. I didn't know this until a few weeks ago. I'm a walking disaster. I'm a demolition man. He wrote the line, demolition woman, can I be your man? Demolition woman, can I be your man? In a whirlwind rush of excitement, they got all this down and more, creating a rough track via drum machine, bass, guitar, and vocals. And then they called it a day. Now, when the rest of the guys came into the studio uh, on Monday, because it was the weekend, you can probably guess their reaction. I mean, they're going to record a new song for the album. This was the last thing that they wanted to do. Everyone just rolled their eyes. But, you know, Mutt Lane convinced them just to listen to what they had. And before they even got a minute into the song, the guys were all going, holy crap, yeah. Although the band was sold on it, the label was still very skeptical. 
They'd already sunk millions of dollars into this project, and they told Mutt to forget about putting it on the album. They probably thought it could wait for the next one. But somehow Mutt Lang convinced them that this was the most important song on Hysteria. He promised to have things wrapped up in two weeks. Which for Mutt Lang, to promise something like that was really big since it would take him weeks just to get one part of his song done, if that. But true to his word, Sugar was banged out in two days and Hysteria was finished in 10. Probably the fastest song Mutt had ever recorded. Now, as we continue to break down this album, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I wear the glasses I always wear. Right now, you can get a complete pair of prescription glasses for less than a vinyl record. You know, and with inflation the way it is, it's kind of a miracle. You can also design your own pair, the color, the shape, the style, whatever you want. Make sure to click on our info button right up here um, or below, and you can get the 80% off of regular retail prices. I'm telling you, you're gonna love it. So back to Sugar. I guess bassist Rick Savage said Mutt knew he had something and that it could be the biggest song of the 80s if we did it right. And he, he was right. According to guitarist uh, Phil Cullen, uh, there were a lot of different genre influences that went into Pours of Sugar on me, including elements of country and rap. Cullen said that when uh, Mutt came up with the song's intro guitar riff, he played it with his fingers and it actually sounded very country. However, Phil Cullen, he couldn't replicate this. I guess his finger picking wasn't up to snuff. So instead, he played it with a metal guitar pick. And that made the song, in his words, into a, uh, a weird hard rock country fusion. <laughs> Phil also pointed out that the inspiration for Joe Elliott's vocals came from none other than Aerosmith and Run DMC. Actually, the rock rap mix of Walk This Way. Walk this way, this way. Said Phil, and I quote, Usually people don't mix genres within one song, and rock bands hardly like rap music. But if you listen to another record that Mutt produced, ACDC's Back in Black, that title track also contains a rap style vocal meter as well. Mutt did a similar thing with us on Sugar, and it worked beautifully. End of quote. Speaking of vocals, uh, Def Leppard, of course, well known for the strength of their backing vocals. It's legendary. A technique that essentially works as another instrument the way they've done it. They're on full display on Pour Some Sugar On Me, giving it uh, really an extra measure of power and attitude. It's spectacular. Phil Collin even called the backing vocals uh, a defining part of the song. He remembers that Mutt Lang practically had him screaming the chorus, you know, using this thick, throaty chest voice that actually had him hurting for days afterwards. Now, when Phil mentioned this to Mutt, the producer replied, yeah, but it was worth it. And you know what? Of course, he was right. <laughs> Summing the whole thing up, Joe Elliott said that pour some sugar on me was the best accident that ever happened to me. And to the band for that matter. Fittingly, he called it one of the most important songs that they ever wrote. You're going to see why in a minute. Again, I know a lot of people think it's overplayed, but when you listen to it with new ears, especially those songs that influence it, it's very cool. Released in the spring of 1988, Pour Some Sugar On Me was actually the fourth single from Hysteria. However, it actually started off really slow. According to Joe Elliott, when Def Leppard initially released the song on American Rock Radio, pretty much bombed. He said it, it just wasn't heavy enough. This spelled bad news for the album, which was already performing well below expectations. Fortunately, uh, the two singles, the first two, they didn't do as well as anticipated. Animal barely broke the top 20 coming in at number 19 on the Hot 100. And Women, we've talked about it, it was hung out to dry at number 80. The title track, Hysteria, it improved on both of those. It went to number 10. But album sales were lagging. Again, they needed to sell 5 million albums just to break even. So this record at that time was in danger of becoming a multi-platinum bust. 
said Phil about it. When the album was finally released, it stopped selling at 3 million copies. Now that might sound blase, but we hadn't made the money back, so we were in debt. And then suddenly, Pour Some Sugar On Me was getting played in the Florida strip bars, and it soon became a strip joint anthem. Uh, it was getting requests on the radio from there. Before we knew it, the album had jumped way back up on the charts. Yeah, you heard that right. Pour Some Sugar On Me actually got his big break from exotic dancers, from, from clubs. <laughs> Maybe that's not really surprising, though. I mean, the song is packed with sensual metaphors, all cleverly hidden in plain sight. Although the word sex is never used, pretty much every line references it. Sugar is clearly provocative, but at the same time, it didn't cross the conservative boundaries of radio programmers. Soon enough, its underground popularity, if you will, uh, in the clubs, in the joints, um, can't say it because of YouTube, uh, it translated into radio play throughout Florida. And after that, it spread like wildfire across America. Requests for this song, it went through the roof. Pour Some Sugar On Me, it entered the Hot 100 at number 93 in April of 88. 14 weeks later, it peaked at number two on July 23rd, 1988. Again, it was held at bay by Richard Marx's uh, ballad, Hold On To The Nights. Hold on to the nights. Pour Some Sugar On Me, it remained in the top 10 though for seven weeks and it hooked America on hysteria. It turned the album into the blockbuster juggernaut that it became. Uh, actually, the album topped the charts for six weeks, and it replaced Van Halen's OU812 in the process. Subsequent singles, they all made their mark on the U.S. charts as well. Armageddon, it reached number three. Love Bites went all the way to number one. Rocket went to number 12. Def Leppard started selling out major venues. Everything just went insane from there. Referring to Sugar, Joe said... It was probably the most important song we've ever done because it was totally responsible for kicking hysteria from big album to extremely big album. In America, it was huge. I mean, it was really, really huge. I remember the record company people telling me like months afterwards, this song was pretty much responsible for selling four million albums in three months, which is a phenomenal amount of records, end of quote. Now, at its peak... Uh, Hysteria was selling at a rate of about 100,000 copies a day. I mean, think about that for a minute. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, Hysteria went on to sell over 12 million units in the U.S. and 25 million plus worldwide. Now, the music video for the song was also a critical component of the song's success. Actually, two different videos were made for this song. The first one was like this concept video featuring a burly female construction worker that was wielding a sledgehammer. And ultimately blows uh, the house to pieces. Fortunately, no band members were hurt in the process. Hey, kind of a fun idea, but uh, it does feel a little cramped, even claustrophobic. That's why they went with a different video. Second version, the most popular one, that would remedy all of this. This time around, Pour Some Sugar On Me showcased the band at their very best as arena rock superstars. The new live video, which was shot at McNichols Sports Arena in Denver in February of 88, uh, was a video that gives you a sense of just how massive this song and this band actually are. It did the trick. The video helped propel Sugar up the charts. I mean, do you remember Dial MTV? 20 minutes or so, we're still gonna be taking calls for your request for Dial MTV. The number is 1-800-DIAL-MTV. I think this was number one for the entire summer of 1988. I mean, I remember I was playing soccer. I'd come home from soccer games every night as a kid. I'd check in to see if it had finished at number one, and it had. I remember calling, and I got in trouble for the phone bill. But since then, Pour Some Sugar On Me has appeared in several movies and TV shows, including Coyote Ugly, which, paying homage to what made it a hit in the first place. There's also Supernatural, Balls of Fury, The Hills, Raising Hope, American Dad, uh, Lip Sync Battle, Family Guy, The Goldbergs, Young Sheldon, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and then there's Rock of Ages with Tom Cruise on the mic. When Tom Cruise was filming his performance, actually, um, Def Leppard, they visited him on the set. 
They wanted to watch him sing in the song, their song. When Tom Cruise met the band, he told them, I'm a little nervous with all you guys here. I learned to sing just for this movie, and I really want to give the song the respect that it deserves, so go easy on me. Now, Tom did lead and backing vocals, actually, and uh, I guess the guys at Def Leppard were pretty impressed. Pour Some Sugar On Me has also been covered by Steel Panther, L.A. Guns, Rascal Flatts. Blake Shelton and Christina Aguilera teamed up on it. Uh, Taylor Swift did it with Def Leppard. Uh, Billy Joel teamed up with Joe Elliott. And um, those were the covers I could find. Let me know if there are some others in the comments. Look, when this album came out, I had just gotten into Pyromania a few years before that. I was a little late to the party. But I remember buying Hysteria on the, the day it came out, the cassette. I listened to this thing like five times a day for like six months. At that time, I spent more batteries to keep my Walkman going than anything else. I remember my parents just yelling at me at least four times a day to turn my radio down. Hysteria, it was like the Sgt. Pepper for our generation for the Generation X. Pour Some Sugar On Me was the crown jewel. And even if it is overplayed, go back and re-listen to it from the perspective of all the songs I mentioned that influenced it. It gives it even more luster. It's the ultimate rock anthem from the ultimate hard rock album of 1987. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Def Leppard, about Pour Some Sugar On Me, about Hysteria. Am I right? Was this like your monumental album when you were growing up? It sure was for me. Let us know in the comments below. Let's have a great uh, fan fest about Def Leppard. Just one of the greatest bands ever. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.